Welcome. Before we get started on our program, we want our community to know that we have live interpretation available in the following languages. Spanish, Vietnamese, Somali, Arabic, and Karen Burmese. We will have each interpreter share the call-in number to access the live interpretation in their language. And we'll call on the interpreters right now to share that call-in information. Andrea, we'll start with you. Could you please start by sharing the Spanish language call-in information? Andrea, can you share the call, uh, conference call and ID information in Spanish and then in Somali, Asma Yusuf? Flair, could you share the Karen Burmese language? Yes, sorry. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fuso da wa da banna mishka maga ego hawa Asma Yusuf. Este es Andrea Rocha y la línea en español se marca el teléfono 1-888-788-0099 con el código 604-043-0746 con la tecla del gato. Thank you, Andrea. Sorry, number que hay sobre que tenemos a más de 10, a más de 10, Ever lava si de lava pink as so good at them how I shan said that shan upper her lava shan sagal ever shan lama had sent I thank you Asma and Pla can you share uh the current Burmese language info um uh the ya bama coffin number gas she 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 co she she don't ya don't ya go go And the ID, please. Oh, ID ga chao le nga nga chao ni shiko tiko. Lynn, could you share the Vietnamese language information, please? Tiên dịch tiếng Việt liên chương xin quý vị gọi vào tám 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 bảy tám tám không không chín chín và số ID nhấn vào là tám không bốn sáu bốn bảy không bốn tám sáu. Thank you. And then Asia, could you share the Arabic language information? Conference call and uh, ID. Marhaban bikum ma'ana. Ma'akum Asia Awad. Mutarjimat al-lugha al-arabiya. Al-raqam hu. 833-54-282-282. Wabad al-raqam. 894-291-2192. Thank you so much. We will begin our program now. Hi and welcome. My name is Ismahan Abdullahi and I'm the Executive Director of MassPace San Diego. Welcome to the CBA's Mayoral Candidates Forum. I am joined by the one and only Angelina who will be co-moderating with me today. And we want to acknowledge this land as Kumayai land, especially as they face threats of eviction and arrest from their sacred lands today. So let's honor the people in the history of this land. In today's forum, Assembly Member Todd Gloria and Council President Pro Tem Barbara Bree are joining us in the hot seat. You will hear directly from the candidates as they answer questions that are important to you and our community. We have an action packed schedule, so hang tight for this ride. But before we begin, let's take a moment to really ground ourselves, especially given the news that we received today and what's happening in Kentucky, to just practice mindfulness. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and we face the continuous trauma 
of black, brown, indigenous loved ones to systemic racism and white supremacy. 2020 has stretched us in ways that we couldn't imagine. But we know our communities are resilient. And in this moment right now, right here, let's take a collective breath together. So breathe with me once, inhale, and exhale. Angelina? Will be my co-moderator. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the CBA. The Community Budget Alliance is a coalition of organizations who fight to create a city budget that is a people's budget. A people's budget provides housing for all and protects tenants. It protects workers and small businesses in our communities without exception, but with a focus on low and moderate income families and communities of color. We know that a system that meets the needs of these families will meet the needs of all of us. And as communities, we are facing unprecedented hardships due to the COVID-19 crisis. We need to ensure that candidates for the mayor of San Diego are held accountable and ensure that their issues center our communities, values, and priorities. We know the mayor holds a lot of power when it comes to ensuring our communities have access to the resources they need. Our mayoral candidate forum today will help shed light on whether our future mayor, their values are aligned with our community's values. Next slide. Through budget advocacy, budget education, and engaging with our community every step of the way, the CBA holds our city and our mayor accountable to the people's budget and priorities. Simple as that. We believe the budget should reflect the community's needs and our city should be transparent about how it spends public dollars and community should have a say in the distribution of public resources. Next slide. Our core priority issues are redefining public safety workers' justice, tenants' rights, democratizing power, and environmental justice. We know that the safest communities have the most resources, not the most police. We need a mayor who invests in the things that keep people safe, such as tenants' rights, workers' rights, language access, environmental justice, and participation in government's decision and priorities. So we must ensure that the next mayor of San Diego shows up for our communities and centers racial justice. We must ensure that the next mayor of San Diego holds law enforcement accountable and invests in alternatives outside the criminal justice system. We must ensure that the next mayor of San Diego prioritizes tenants, affordable housing, and ensures our communities have access to eviction protection and counseling. We must create a government that is responsive to community members and that centers our struggle in its budget and policy making. Community members must be part of this process and work collaboratively with our elected officials, city employees, community organizations, and labor unions to steer the government, to steer the way government functions. So we must prioritize environmental justice because we know that those most burdened by climate change are our communities and communities of color. The next mayor of San Diego must ensure equitable access to a healthy and thriving environment. So these issues are critical to our community. So they must be a priority for the next mayor of San Diego. The CBA will continue to advocate for the people's budget at the city level so we can truly become America's finest city instead of it being a slogan thrown around for no reason. Budgets are a reflection of our values, what we are centering and prioritizing, and our community's needs deserve to be centered. We need to make it clear to the next mayor of San Diego that a budget that does not reflect our community's needs is not a budget for the people. This forum is an opportunity to see where our candidates' values and priorities lie, and if they are aligned with us and our priorities.
Thank you, Isfahan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Angelina Corsani. I'm a researcher and policy analyst at the Center on Policy Initiatives, and I'm going to be one of your moderators this evening. So as you all just heard from Ismahan, these are some pretty significant areas of work, and our goal is big. It's to consistently push towards transformative change. And although that might seem like more than what could be possible locally, it's actually absolutely the case that many key budget and policy decisions do happen at the city level. The city is responsible for essential services that are of most immediate concern to residents. To give a sense of just how many services and the thousands of jobs that that includes, I'll give some specific examples. The city is responsible for street lights, street and sidewalk improvements, stormwater services, trash services, sewer system services and maintenance. The city is also responsible for libraries, recreation centers, swimming pools, parks, and not just providing these spaces, but also maintenance and cleaning of those spaces as well as the programs and services that are offered to community members there. While the sheriff department and jails are under county jurisdiction, San Diego Police Department is housed in the city of San Diego. This means that the city is also responsible for funding or defunding the police department. In addition to all these things, the city also creates and influences policy around things like housing development, workers' rights, and our city also plays a role in decisions related to our regional transportation system. Actually, the city can really choose to create any type of policy on any issue it wants to, as long as it doesn't directly conflict with a state or federal law. So there are a lot of really important decisions that can happen at the city level. And every year, this city creates and manages what's now a $4 billion budget. Budgets aren't just financial documents, they're policy documents and moral documents that show us what our government officials have decided is most important. Next slide, please. And in San Diego, we have what's called a strong mayor form of government. What that means is that our mayor has a lot of power and the values and priorities reflected in our city budget are very much the values and priorities of our mayor. And that's the reason it was so important for us to have a mayoral candidate forum this year. In our city, the mayor is the ultimate decider and decision maker. Our mayor creates the budget and has the power to make any cuts or additions they see fit. Our mayor can propose any policy they want to, and the mayor can also veto any policy passed by city council that doesn't have a two thirds majority vote. For many years, our coalition has been pushing hard and doing our best to reshape our city budget to focus on community needs so that it invests in programs, services, and policies that will improve the quality of life for all residents in San Diego. But this has been a really difficult fight. We've been very limited by our current mayor who has a set of values and priorities that don't align with the work our coalition is doing. The graph in this slide provides an excellent snapshot of our current mayor's priorities. Again, budgets are moral and policy documents. So as you look at this graph, just be thinking about what's important to you and your communities versus what our mayor is investing in. So you can see that over half a billion dollars, which is over one third of our total general fund, goes just to the police department. And please keep in mind that there are at least 43 other city departments that provide all of those essential services that I just mentioned. I look at this graph every year and it's something that always shocks me, but we all know that this year was a little different. COVID-19 has been an unprecedented pandemic that has hit our economy and our people really, really hard. But even as all of our lives were changing in ways that they never had before, our mayor didn't change. The graph on this slide is for this year's budget. So this was the budget that was just approved and adopted this June. Our mayor continued business as usual, and actually he went beyond that. Our city received $156 million in relief funds from the state and federal government to make up for revenue losses because the city relies on taxes and those have gone down. We pushed hard for those funds to be used for things that people really need to survive in this moment, like rent relief to make sure families who've lost income can stay in their homes and internet access for low income families so that all kids can have access to their educations. Instead, our mayor chose to use $42.2 million of relief funds, almost a third of it, for police payroll, staffing, and supplies. I mentioned I'm surprised every year when I look at this graph, but I'll admit I was more shocked this year than I've ever been. 
These decisions tell you a lot about how one mayor's priorities can directly impact the lives and livelihoods of city residents. So this November is an extremely critical opportunity to have a change in leadership, and you all can play a role in that by making sure to vote. If you can't vote, you can tell your friends and family, and you can still join us throughout the year as we hold our mayor accountable, whoever they may be. This evening, we want you all to be able to understand our mayoral candidates better, understand what their values and priorities are, so that in November, you can make the most informed decision possible and the decision that will be best for you, your families, and your communities. Next slide, please. So with that, I'll ask this year's candidates for the mayor of San Diego to introduce themselves. We have Council President Pro Tem Barbara Bree and Assembly Member Todd Gloria joining us today. Uh, we've asked their permission to refer to them by their first names for the remainder of the program. Todd and Barbara, if you haven't already, oh, I see your cameras are on, awesome. So we're gonna be giving each of the candidates two minutes to introduce themselves to you all and make an opening statement. To keep things fair, we're gonna be alternating who speaks first and who responds to questions first throughout the program. But to start, we decided who would be giving the opening statement first using a coin toss. A video recording of the coin toss was sent to both candidates ahead of time. So we can just go ahead and start with a two minute, two minute opening statement from Barbara first, followed by Todd. Uh, Barbara, please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you for inviting us here tonight. I'd like to thank the Community Budget Alliance and CPI for all that you do. You've met, we've met many times at my council office. Uh, we used to meet in person. I look forward to when we'll be able to do that again. And I appreciate all that you're doing to engage community residents in the budget process. And over the years, I've enjoyed attending many CPI poker nights, and I look forward to being able to do that again. A little bit about me. I ran for city council in 2016 after a career as a journalist and a small business owner and starting two organizations that empower women. I ran because I was frustrated that the street in front of my office was being torn up yet again for the same work, a waste of your money. When I arrived at City Hall, I found a culture of no accountability and no transparency, a place where major decisions are made behind closed doors. I stood up to it immediately. I was the first elected official to oppose the Soccer City land grab, and I held together a fragile council coalition to get the SDSU West transaction done. I was thrilled to attend the groundbreaking in August. This is the most transformative project in our region in decades and is going to provide educational opportunities to thousands more San Diegans. And it demonstrates that with the right leadership, San Diego can do big things. I was the first elected official to demand answers and transparency about the disastrous 101 Ash Street purchase led by my opponent when he was on the city council. This is money that could be spent improving your neighborhoods. You're right, COVID-19 has magnified existing inequities. And as mayor, my first priority is to lead an economic recovery that includes all of us. In June, we released my Roadmap to Recovery, which I worked on with a diverse group of small business owners and community leaders to address these issues and more. I will bring my years of experience in business, the nonprofit sector and government to leading our city and I look forward to the conversation tonight. Todd, please go ahead. Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for calling me Todd. You can always call me Todd. Um, I appreciate this chance to talk about the budget as someone who was chair of our city's budget committee for six years. I love an opportunity to get wonky about how we spend our limited tax dollars and which priorities uh, should be reflected uh, by the next mayor. Um, many of you know me well. I'm a third generation San Diegan. I grew up, I was part of a working class family here in San Diego, a family uh, raised by a hotel maid and a gardener, two people who were able to work hard and buy a home in San Diego, put my brother and I through college, the first in our family to go. In many ways, I have lived the dream that is the promise of San Diego, but my public service is driven by the fact that I recognize that for many of you, that story is not possible, no matter how hard you work. And throughout my time as a city council member, as a council president, interim mayor, or as an assembly member, you've seen me champion many of the issues that we share in common. Working with CPI to help pass an increased minimum wage with paid sick days, overcoming corporate opposition to get 
that done at the ballot box. Passing a landmark climate action plan that makes San Diego a national leader when it comes to fighting global climate change. Working at SANDAG and at MTS to advance things like youth opportunity bus passes and fighting back against eliminations of service hours and, and uh, head, uh, headways for our buses and for our trolleys. I'm running for mayor because I wanna build, build a bold progressive city that works for all of us. That means communities north of the eight as well as south of the eight, for black and brown communities, for LGBT communities, folks who too often have not seen themselves reflected in government. And this is where I would acknowledge that never in our city's history have we elected a person of color or a queer person to the mayor's office. We have the chance to make that history in this election. And I promise that I will have an administration that is as diverse as the community I seek to lead, as, as diverse as the community we are here to serve. I look forward to answering your questions this evening. Thank you both. We will begin our open-ended questions section of our program. And in this portion, Angelina and I will alternate between six questions. Each question will provide context for our listeners who are tuned in as well as you. And both of you will have about two and a half minutes to respond. And unfortunately, since we only have an hour with you, uh, we want to get through all of our questions in a timely manner. So we will hold you to that time limit. Angelina and I will let each candidate know when is their turn to speak. And when you have 10 seconds left, um, the moderator will turn their camera back on. And so please take this as your cue to wrap up in 10 seconds. And again, if you do go over time, we will kindly interrupt um, because this is going to be us reclaiming the community's time. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first open-ended question, and uh, Todd, you will be responding to this question first. After the murder of George Floyd, calls to defund the police have intensified. And we've seen several cities across the nation finally begin to respond to years of activism and organizing, especially by black leaders, by removing law enforcement from cases where community needs will be better served by a different entity. So for example, Minnesota school board voted to remove police from their schools. Uh, Berkeley City Council is considering a proposal to remove police from traffic enforcement and Eugene, Oregon has been sending mental health specialists and community health paramedics to 911 calls that are related to mental health throughout their CAHOOTS program. So what roles and responsibilities do you think should be removed from the SDPD's purview? And what are some opportunities that you see uh, for police free responses and alternatives? And what will those alternatives to law enforcement be? And how do you plan on funding them? Thank you, Ismahan. Uh, great question. So in terms of direct, an ooh, you took the thing off the screen. Uh, <laughs> let me make sure I do my best to answer all three of those. So in terms of areas where I think that there is obvious consensus and an appropriate uh, thing to change would be around mental health uh, responses, uh, around homeless outreach, around truancy enforcement. I think that these are would be important steps uh, to make sure that those who are trained professionals to do that work rather than law enforcement who are often not trained to do this work and often do it at greater cost uh, to the community. Um, for this, I don't know if you have the second question, you can put it back up again. Uh, but if I could um, go to what the, the solutions for that would be, you know, we have modeled some of this behavior in the past. We have had a psychological emergency response team that is currently active uh, in our community, utilizing trained uh, professionals to interact with the mentally ill. I think uh, uh, more effort uh, where that is concerned, making sure that we take down down, uh, the the, uh, um, the tempo in these situations, slow things down and allow for more uh, less uh, violent uh, outcomes to happen is important. I think for truancy officers, I think, you know, addressing the school to prison pipeline could be addressed by making sure that that's not a law enforcement intervention, but is rather a social service intervention that understands why the student is out of school and how we can best respond to it. And thank you for putting the slide back up. Um, some opportunities for other police free responses. I'm familiar with what's happening in Berkeley. I'm familiar with happening in Eugene and in Minnesota. I do note that there are a lot of folks in the community who are very concerned about the lack of enforcement of various rules around our community. I would note that the city just this past week somehow or another found the time and the resources to uh, power wash uh, chalk race uh, off a sidewalk in La Jolla that referred to Black Lives Matter. We have the ability to enforce on that, but we can't enforce uh, simple rules that would make bicycling safer in a community. Other kinds of uh, traffic infractions that never get prioritized and to the extent that our city treasurer 
treasurer's office already does parking enforcement, it would seem that there would be a non-law enforcement way to make sure that those who park their vehicle uh, in bicycle lanes, that those who maybe leave their garbage can out uh, and sidewalks blocking the right of way, these would be ways where we could uh, have a different kind of response, a response that would be less expensive, that might yield some savings, that we can invest in other parts of our community where we have significant social needs. Thank you. And just a reminder, we will have the questions posted on the chat um, for our um, candidates to take a look. And Barbara, go ahead. Thank you. Well, it's clear we ask police officers to do things they aren't trained to do or meant to do, uh, particularly responding to um, homeless individuals, to mental health calls, uh, for truancy. These aren't things that our police officers, or traffic enforcement, these aren't things that we should be have, need to have our police officers doing. So right now we do, for example, have a homeless outreach team, but they aren't funded enough that we can have access to them 24 by seven. So if you call and you want to have a mental health professional who is a part of that team go out, you get a, the voicemail, which is only listened to once a day. And we need to have a seamless system so that when someone is seeking help or someone in a neighborhood wants to get help for someone, they know they can call a number, have a real human being answer it, and that the appropriately trained professional will show up to solve the problem. Um, this is something that, as you noted, has been, is being done in other cities. It's certainly something that can be done in San Diego. The, the issue is having the willingness of a mayor to sit down and think holistically about what does public safety look like? What does it mean to protect our community? And that's what I intend to do with a task force that will include you and other experts in this area. So we can design a system that truly works for San Diego which years ago was a leader in neighborhood policing where police officers did get out of their cars, got to know their community, and that was a key part of making residents feel safe. And what public safety is in each neighborhood is different. The data is clear. There is racial disparity in policing. If a, if a person of color is walking down a street in Southeast San Diego, they may feel unsafe if a police officer walks up to them. In Pacific Beach, on, on Garnot Avenue, on a Friday and Saturday night, they would like an additional police presence because of the violence that sometimes erupts of people you know, drinking too much and coming out of the bars. Okay, we're now gonna be asking our open-ended question on workers' justice. Barbara, please respond to this question first. Unsafe workplaces can be deadly, especially in a pandemic. Workplace safety is a matter of public health, specifically because workers are building blocks of families, communities, and businesses. According to the county, there have been many outbreaks at retail stores and restaurants, which are both also associated with low wages and wage theft. Many workers in these affected occupations are putting themselves, their coworkers, and their families at risk to try to make ends meet. What specific actions will you take to protect workers and ensure workplaces are safe and healthy during the pandemic and beyond? The pandemic has made us all appreciate the role of essential workers. I mean, as I go to the grocery store every week, as I go to CVS, I'm very appreciative of the people who are there working, expose, you know, exposing themselves to all the customers, not knowing, you know, we're all wearing masks now, but not knowing you know, what disease we may be carrying and, you know, putting themselves and their families at risk. As mayor, I will make sure that we enforce any laws to make sure that employers create a safe work environment. I will work collaboratively with the county, which is our region's health agency, to make sure that city employers are following all appropriate rules to keep both their workers and their customers safe. This is the only way we're going to be able to continue to open up our economy to get people back to work and to have a, a, a San Diego that's going to thrive going forward. Thank you, Todd, please go ahead. 
uh, well, I'm not waiting to become mayor to step up uh, for uh, workers uh, in this pandemic. Uh, I was proud to support a bill in the legislature, AB 685, which creates an employee, employer mandate to make sure that uh, employees inform workers when there is an outbreak in their work, uh, in their setting. Um, I think that the city, uh, through our city attorney, can uh, help enforce the state enforce that, make sure that employers are doing what they're, resp what they're responsible for under this law. Uh, and there's other additional pieces of legislation that I've voted for and that are on the governor's desk that would provide additional protections to workers who are struggling during this uh, difficult time. I would point out that I have a record of doing this. Uh, I would point out that it was extremely controversial and many fought back against uh, my request to provide every San Diego worker five paid sick days. That was only a few years ago. But working with a coalition inclusive of CPI, we won that for every San Diego worker and they have that ability today. Uh, I think the best judge of what someone will do in the future is what they've done in the past. And you've seen me lead on protecting low wage workers, making sure that they have access to critical things like paid sick days. And, and again, supporting pieces of legislation that are coming into effect now because of the pandemic, that it's gonna be important that we actually enforce it on a local level. Thank you both. Now we'll be asking the questions around democratizing power. And um, Todd, you will be responding to this question first. So San Diego is a border region, but we often do not acknowledge that identity. So what does the border mean to you? And what will you do to make San Diego a welcoming place for immigrants and refugees? Uh Thank you for asking this question. I think one of the greatest features of our region is that we are a binational mega region and we benefit not just with the commerce that goes across our border, but with the culture that goes back and forth. And I recognize that many in our community live on both sides of this border, uh, live on one side, work on another, recreate on, an, on the other side. Uh, and we need a mayor that recognizes and understands that. Um, I have no problem whatsoever uh, making sure that I speak up on this, uh, on this account. Uh, San Diego is the largest border city in the United States, and as a consequence, you have a national platform to articulate on matters like immigration, like uh, refugees, and many of the other uh, issues that are brought up because of our border um, that, quite honestly, are uh, front page news stories uh, that someone needs to speak out against. I will have no problem whatsoever speaking out against the Trump administration uh, on some of the uh, horrible policies that are harming our community right here in San Diego. I acknowledge our current mayor likes to talk about the border often in economic terms. I prefer to talk about it in humanistic terms, recognizing that this is uh, our human life. These are our families. They are, these are our children that are impacted by this. In terms of what we can do, well, we've taken some steps in this direction. I was proud to help secure funding to, uh, from the state level to help finance uh, the uh, asylee uh, seeking uh, shelter. Uh, it is currently housed or was housed prior to the closure of the border uh, at a state-owned facility in my assembly district. Uh, JFS, one of the providers for that uh, operation, uh, was my nonprofit of the year last year. Um, what that was done there was a wonderful public-private collaboration that has saved thousands of folks from becoming homeless and left uh, with penniless on our streets. That kind of collaboration shouldn't be necessary, but in Trump's America, and sadly it is. And again, as mayor, uh, I would have no trouble whatsoever speaking up and speaking out about this. And I would note that our current mayor has had the opportunity to have an audience with the president in the Oval Office. Many of you probably saw the photo of the two of them smiling. I can promise you that if I ever met with Donald Trump, he would not be smiling after I speak with him. Thank you, Todd. Barbara? Yes. So we are a binational region. Uh, families live and work on both sides of the border. Pre-pandemic, pre uh, many of us enjoyed going to Tijuana for a good restaurant, to go to the beach, uh, for a good cultural experience. And it's very sad what has happened with the Trump administration. Uh, when the Trump administration started dropping off um, immigrants in this country without notice, when I started doing that, I volunteered at the shelter that JFS was then running in the South Bay. And I was very moved to see families. Um, and the, the grownups were all wearing ankle bracelets. They'd all been processed through the system. They were all going to a final destination to live with family or friends. But they, they had taken enormous risks because they wanted a better life for their children. And I was very, very moved. Uh, what can I do as mayor? Well, what I've already done as a council member is the uh, I have approved hiring a, a director level person at the city who is working with integrating our immigrant populations. 
Our immigrant populations are part of what makes this city great and diverse. And there is actually economic data that immigrants start businesses at a faster rate than people who are born in the United States. So they create jobs for themselves and for others and are a very important part of the San Diego economy. Um, as mayor, I will have a senior level person in my office who will work with cro on cross-border issues, uh, environmental, economic, cultural, uh, sewage, uh, because we are a mega region. And I started working on this issue in the 1990s when I was at UCSD, and I started a pioneering program called Cross Border Connect, which only lasted for a few years because the economy on both sides of the border fell apart. But at that time, we were bringing together business and community leaders, then focused on software and telecom, people who had never talked to each other before. And this is what I have a track record of doing my whole life, connecting people to move our city forward. I'm now gonna be asking our open-ended question on tenants' rights. Um, Barbara, you'll be responding to this one first. In San Diego, a majority of residents are tenants. Even before COVID-19, most spent more than 30% of their income on rent. Many tenants don't know their legal rights or don't have access to affordable legal services to protect themselves from unfair or even illegal evictions. In addition, the city does not collect any data on evictions or available rental housing, and the city does not invest in infrastructure to actually enforce laws that are supposed to ensure bad landlords aren't taking advantage of tenants. Compared to other major cities, San Diego has limited legal protections, resources, and infrastructure for tenants, and this means that many San Diegans don't have access to stable housing. Housing assistance became even more crucial with COVID-19. However, the rent relief fund approved by the city was grossly insufficient. These funds will help only about 3,500 households, leaving an estimated 180,000 low-income households without support. When the city passed an eviction moratorium, many residents were still at risk because the city has not invested in outreach and services that can inform and explain new laws to tenants. After the moratorium protections expire, tens of thousands are at risk of eviction. If you are elected mayor, how will you ensure that more San Diegans have access to stable and affordable housing? How will you ensure stronger legal protections for tenants? And what investments would you make to provide more resources for tenants in San Diego? So tenants' rights are among many problems we have. And I think it could be, part of it could be addressed in three words, enforce the law. When we have a landlord who has code violations, who, ex who has substandard housing and is collecting rent from tenants, we need to enforce the law. Long-term, we need to provide more housing that is more affordable to working families. That's, one, that's the most significant way we will address rental issues. And the pandemic has offered up an opportunity to do adaptive reuse of office buildings and commercial buildings, which is much cheaper than building new housing. Uh, just a few days ago, I met with a company that bought an older office building in Linda Vista and was able to convert it for, to studio apartments for $90,000 a unit. That's providing housing that working families can afford. And as mayor, I'm going to look at what policies we need to do to encourage more of this adaptive reuse. Because at the end of the day, we have to have more housing. And then the market will play more housing that's affordable to working families, not more million dollar condos or rents of $3,000 a month and more. But there, will, there are opportunities to create this housing. It's why I supported the inclu new inclusionary policy that's going into effect over the next few years at which new construction will have to provide 10% of all new units on the property um, as affordable or pay a much higher in lieu fee than they've had to pay in the past, which goes into our city's housing trust fund and then can be used as equity by low income housing developers to build new affordable units. So the combination of all of these will provide more housing units and then as mayor, I will make sure that we enforce against bad landlords. Thank you, Todd, please go ahead. Yes, um, 
So affordable housing has been the centerpiece of my uh, career. I served on our city's housing commission, chaired our housing committee. I serve in the housing committee in the legislature today. And the question was, how will you ensure more San Diegans have access to stable and affordable housing? And I think it actually st starts with the rhetoric that we use. I think during the course of this mayoral campaign, my opponent has used fairly uh, divisive, divisive language uh, to inform communities that affordable housing in your neighborhood is necessarily bad, that more housing at whatever price point will harm your community. You don't see me engaging in that behavior because I don't believe that that's the case. In my own city council district, I was able to use new housing to take neighborhoods like Little Italy and North Park and make them better places. And so it starts a lot with the atmosphere, it's the climate, it's the language, charged and not charged language uh, that is used, but whether or not we can get communities to understand that this can be good, that this additional housing is so necessary to relieve the cost burdens that so many families experience. How do we get more housing? Well, after you uh, establish a consensus that more housing is necessary, then we have to go about the work of doing it. It has to be done in an equitable fashion. We can't continue to push all the low income housing in a certain city council districts, always knowing that other city council districts never have to engage in that particular process, particularly when it comes to permanent supportive housing. And so we must do this in an equitable way. I think going forward, we're going to have to make sure that we get creative. We have to work with our affordable housing developers to make sure that they understand that if they want to propose a project, they have a willing partner at the city that's going to work with them to help actually create that particular project. And importantly, we have to focus on housing that is not subsidized, but is still affordable, particularly to working San Diegans. We recognize there are a lot of folks who earn too much to qualify for any of the programs that the Housing Commission offers, and yet, of course, make not nearly enough for any of the new housing that is being built in our community. Lastly, with regard to enforcement again, uh, for uh, tenants' rights, um, I can foresee a, a stronger partnership uh, with organizations like Legal Aid Society of San Diego. We know that when tenants are represented uh, in legal disputes, if they have legal representation, the likelihood of a positive outcome for, the com outcome for them increases exponentially. And that we can play a role in making sure that more tenants locally have that protection. And importantly, I think it's that we, we must help uh, tenants uh, enforce against AB, uh, in support of AB 14. 1882, a bill that I supported, which prohibits excessive rent gouging against, uh, uh, against Californians. Thank you both. We will be asking our open-ended question on environmental justice next, and Toddy will be responding to this question first. Outdoor recreation is critical to San Diego's health, economy, workforce, and quality of life. So yet many communities, especially those south of the eight in communities of color, face significant barriers to park access and outdoor engagement programs. And organizations that run programs to increase outdoor access for low-income communities have struggled to secure city permits in areas such as Mission Bay, uh, Emerald Hills Neighborhood Park in Southeast San Diego still lack significant park improvements after decades of advocacy to address these issues, such as like moldy water fountains, open electrical uh, sockets, and dangerously outdated playground equipment. Land in Boston Avenue, located in Barrio Logan, has been designated as a potential park space since the 1970s. I mean, we're talking about the 1970s. Yet this project still has not been prioritized by the city. So meanwhile, higher income areas north of the eight, such as La Jolla, Carmel Valley, and Rancho Bernardo, benefit from impeccably maintained golf courses, clean, safe, and newly updated parks and playgrounds, and well-funded outdoor engagement programs for children and youth. We see the disparities. How do you plan on addressing these and other disparities to ensure that all San Diegans can have a meaningful connection to our parks, our beaches, and our bays. Thank you, Ismahan. So the inequities you described are real, and you mentioned one community that is particularly uh, emblematic of this inequity, uh, Barrio Logan. Uh, when I served as the city's interim mayor, we worked to pass a community plan update for Barrio Logan. That plan was referendized by large corporations uh, and unfortunately was defeated at the ballot. Uh, the current mayor had promised that he would get that plan done before he leaves office. 
clearly that is not going to be done. An updated community plan could be determinative for the future of Barrio Logan because in addition to creating a consensus about where new development must go and how we work on issues like uh, anti-gentrification, it also assesses new fees uh, on developers who wish to build in those communities and those fees are often what pay for the kinds of park improvements that you're describing. Uh, and so we can't have more Barrio Logan community plans that are decades in the making, get referendized by a select few of special interests and renders that community having to wait years upon years to get progress. And I think that's instructive for many other communities. I think going forward, there are proposals at City Hall right now to create a citywide park fee that would allow more communities to socialize the, the costs of park improvements, uh, no matter where the fees are collected, but to make sure that parks and neighborhoods where that investment has not typically gone can actually benefit from. And I identify with that because I think for many of us, we don't always use the amenities in our neighborhood for some of the reasons you mentioned, Ismahan, is the fact that the park in our neighborhood may not be as as nice as ones in other communities and therefore we travel to those other areas. I think the very fact that we don't live one neighborhood lives means that when we can utilize resources from other communities, we as San Diegans collectively collectively can benefit. So um, ultimately, it's going to be about whether or not you have a mayor that's willing to short circuit community plans like was done for Barrio Logan, or one who's going to stand up and make sure they get done. And by doing so, making sure the developers pay the full freight and making sure that we get the fees that actually make the neighborhood uh, improvements happen. Um, I think that's uh, probably the most direct way that we can address the uh, access issues, acknowledging that thankfully here in California, we have the Coastal Act, which makes sure that every Californian is supposed to have direct access to our beaches and bays. I know that for many communities, that's simply not the case, and we can do better by that. Again, judge me by what I've done in the past when I was on the city council and represented City Heights, working closely with folks in the Choice uh, uh, Creek communities. We've turned those from neighborhood nuisances to neighborhood jewels. We should be doing that throughout San Diego. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. It starts that the disparity exists. And as a council member, I supported having a disparity study done regarding our parks. And it gave us concrete information and data on what we need to do now, which is particularly invest in our parks south of Interstate 8. And that is what this council has started to do with the funds that it has available. And I have voted to support it. Um, it's clear, and I've also been very supportive of the new San Diego Parks Foundation which was started about two years ago, uh, which provided a temporary pool at City Heights last, uh, not this past summer because of COVID, but the summer before, uh, since the, a new pool is being built there and has been installing Wi-Fi at parks uh, starting south of eight. And uh, this parks found, we have a library foundation that does similar things. We hadn't had a parks foundation. And I think having the parks foundation, which is separate from the city, but it has private philanthropic money is going to be very important in investing in communities south of eight to so that they have the parks that they deserve. And I heard you describe the bureaucracy and the hurdles in trying to get permits. I hear that story over and over again as I visit neighborhoods all over the city. The difficulty of dealing with city bureaucrats to get things done that should be easy to do. It's very frustrating, it's not acceptable. You all are residents and taxpayers in the city of San Diego and you deserve better. As mayor, I will cut through the bureaucracy. When we have an issue in a particular area, we're going to meet, we're gonna get everyone in the city who's involved in that issue around the table, whether it's on Zoom or in person, and we're gonna figure out what we need to do to get it done. We're gonna set a timeline and we're gonna hold people accountable. And that's what's missing at City Hall right now. That's why I'm running for mayor. Council members do not run the city bureaucracy. They do not have the authority. And as mayor, I will have the authority to make sure that City Hall is responsible and responsive to you. Okay, I'm gonna be asking our final open-ended question. This is gonna be our last question in this section before we move on to the next section of the program. Uh, just as a reminder to candidates, uh, please try to speak at a pace that keeps the interpreters in mind, just like a tad slower than usual. And um, Barbara, you're going to be responding to this question first. So currently, our city government does not have a centralized space that prioritizes children, youth, and their families. We are asking for the creation of an Office of Child and Youth Success, which exists in most major cities across the nation. 
the office would serve as a centralized space for planning, coordination, and community participation that would ensure the welfare of children, youth, and their families. What does child and youth success in San Diego look like to you? Do you support the concept and investment in an office in your cabinet dedicated to child and youth success? And are you willing to prioritize this in your first year as mayor? So ever since I've been running for council back in 2016, I've talked about the importance of training our young people for future careers, particularly in the good paying jobs of tech and biotech, which traditionally have not been available to young people growing up south of Interstate 8. As mayor, my, my office is going to include a school engagement coordinator who's going to develop structured relationships with schools, starting with schools south of Interstate 8, so that from a young age, children understand all the opportunities available to them in science, technology, engineering, math, the employers could be everybody from the Old Globe to SDG&E to Illumina and Qualcomm. And then as they get older, they will get access to paid internships. Tech and biotech are coming downtown in a big way. It's going to explode over the next few years, making these jobs more accessible via public transit for children growing up in City Heights, Barrio Logan, and Otay Mesa. And it is my vision as mayor to make sure that the next generation of children has access to these jobs. Listen, I'm a mom and a grandma. Uh, by March, my husband Neil and I will have seven grandchildren. The last two are identical boy twins, and they're gonna be growing up in San Diego. And that's who I'm thinking about, all of our children and grandchildren, as I'm making decisions for the future. Todd, you go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question was about uh, supporting uh, the Office of Child and Youth Success. And I wanna uh, be very direct, as I've always been with the Community uh, Budget Alliance, that we know that the city is facing a significant budget deficit. And so the creation of new offices is, are gonna be extremely difficult. But you have my commitment, as you've always had, to earnestly hear every proposal and to do my very best to, to make sure that we can meet that responsibility because we obviously already spend a significant amount of funds uh, in different ways to try and address the children and youth, but it is not coordinated in the way that I believe this proposal is intended to be. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have, uh, uh, we have a Connected Careers program at the city that started when I was uh, on the city council. The city's commitment to that program has stayed flat over all these years, uh, which is uh, unfortunate and is not reflective of what our peer cities may do. But this program is important for making taking youth who are otherwise unoccupied uh, during our summer youth months or also or, or not engaged in the worlds of work or in school and puts them to work. And I think it's a critical place for us to make an investment, an investment that actually may uh, uh, have significant return on investment by acknowledging that keeping these kids occupied and getting them pathways to careers uh, ultimately ends up being a good thing for all taxpayers. I'd point out that we have a gang uh, commission and prevention, but I feel like in many ways that prevention, that commission is too backward looking or too late in the process and that some of our resources there should be moved up earlier so in, in order to make sure that we're addressing the needs of children before they need a gang commission. And I think that that is again aware where we could take a connected careers and the gang commission uh, and some of our other resources and combine them together perhaps in an office of child and youth service youth success uh, in order to get some progress in this regard. I would continue to be a champion for making sure uh, that our community works well for young people. I believe that we can do better at San Dag and MTS, uh, particularly when it comes to transit usage by young people and students. Uh, I think that other cities are looking at making uh, uh, student uh, use of the transit system fare free is something that we could do here in San Diego if we had the political will to do it. So there's much that we can do there, but I want to again be honest about the size of the deficit that we're anticipating, but again, repeat my commitment to try and reimagine the work that we're doing in silos currently and putting them together in a holistic approach that actually would impact more positively impact the children of our community. Okay. Um, thank you to both of the candidates for answering our open-ended questions. We're now moving to our next section where we're going to be asking rapid fire questions. Each of our five CBA working groups have identified three rapid fire questions. So we're going to be asking a total of 15 rapid fire questions. 
we'll be switching moderators and alternating who responds to the questions first for each section. So for the candidates, the moderator will let you know at the beginning of each section who should be responding to those questions first. And just to be super clear, we do want both candidates, candidates to respond to the question before we ask the next question. Um, in order to stay on schedule and so that we can show respect to our community's time, we are asking that you keep uh, please keep your answers limited to just yes or no for this section. So Ismahan will start with the first set of questions. Thank you, Angelina. The first set of questions uh, deal with redefining public safety. And Todd, please respond to the questions as they are asked. Um, first question, Measure B, which San Diego residents will vote on in November, would create an independent commission on police practices at the city and the independent budget analyst has calculated that the city will need to allocate at least a million, or at least a little over a million, in order to pay for the staff that would serve on this commission. If Measure B passes this November, will you support this allocation, uh, this allocation in the budget? Yes, 100%. All right, next question. Are bias policing and racial and identity profiling issues for the police department in San Diego? Yes, and we have multiple studies that prove that. And last question, for many years, our communities have highlighted the unnecessary criminalization of low level offenses and misdemeanors. Folks have said that things like traffic violations, loitering and public intoxication should not warrant jail time and or a criminal record all of which can have devastating long-term impacts on an individual's housing and employment opportunities. Do you support the decriminalization of low-level offenses and misdemeanors in the city of San Diego? Yes or no? Yes, maybe with some qualifications, but yes, for most of that, yes. Thank you. Barbara, um, same questions? Uh, I can, I'll make it easy for you. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Okay, we're moving to the rapid fire questions on workers justice. Barbara, please respond to all of the questions in this section first. Um, and I'm gonna get answers from both of y'all before moving to the next question, if that's okay. Um, first question, a 2017 report by the Economic Policy Institute estimated that low wage workers in California lose approximately $2 billion a year to wage violations committed by their employers. The, the State Labor Commission has specifically reached out to the city of San Diego asking for local enforcement of labor standards because the state is already overwhelmed by the number of cases it's currently working on. Many other cities have invested in local enforcement mechanisms that have been successful in supporting workers against bad employers. Do you commit to fighting wage theft and other labor law violations by creating an Office of Labor Standards Enforcement at the city level? I guarantee to continue fighting for workers' rights and wage enforcement, but given the budgetary issues, I cannot commit at this time to a new department. Would like to work with you on how we can accomplish it within the existing infrastructure. Todd? Yes, in the sense that we already do this work through the Treasury Office. I think we can do a better job of it, and we're happy to work with you to figure out how to do, do so. Okay. I'm going to move to the next question, and uh, please keep your answers to yes and no if you can. Recently, one of our coalition partners collaborated with the Maintenance Corporation Trust Fund, MCTF, to support a janitorial worker who had filed a labor law violation claim at the city. The worker had submitted their claim against a company called PRISM to the city's living wage office. The living wage office is supposed to ensure that employers the city contracts with are following, its, their, uh, following wage and labor laws. However, this worker filed a complaint against PRISM three years ago and this company has also been responsible for multiple other worker violations, including wage theft and denial of sick leave. This company has yet to be debarred. Wage theft is a crime. Do you commit to penalizing employers who commit wage theft within an appropriate timeline? Definitely, yes. Todd? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Last question in this section. We know that black and brown workers have been most impacted by layoffs in San Diego and are least likely to be rehired. However, many other cities are passing recall and retention laws that ensure workers who are laid off have the right to return to their jobs first before any new employees are hired. 
The San Diego City Council recently passed a recall and retention ordinance that is only in effect until March 2021. The City Council said they passed a short-term city ordinance because there is a state-level recall and retention bill, AB 3216, that may protect workers if the governor decides to sign it. If AB 3216, which would establish the statewide worker recall and retention law, is vetoed by the governor, will you lead the charge for a stronger worker recall and retention ordinance when you are mayor? I want to see where we are in March of 2021 in terms of our economy. I did vote yes on the city ordinance, um, but I want to see where we are. I will not guarantee that I would vote yet, that I would do, move forward with this. Just want to clarify that was a, a no. No. Thank you, Todd. I voted for AB 3216, so yes. Okay. Thank you. Now we'll be asking the rapid fire questions on democratizing power. And Todd, please respond to the questions. First in this section, will you help ensure that all immigrants and refugees are eligible for city programs and services, regardless of their immigration status? Yes. Barbara? Yeah. Yes. And next question, according to the most recent census data, more than 40% of San Diegans speak a language uh, other than English and over 200,000 city residents and about 50%, about 15% of the total population do not speak English well or at all. And despite the language diversity in our population, most of the city's public communication and materials are not accessible in the languages that our communities speak. Currently, interpretation for public comments at council hearings is only available if requested three days ahead, and meeting agendas are only available in English, and press conferences are usually only in English. So do you commit to funding, interpretation, and translation services that will be readily available for the languages most commonly spoken in our city? Todd? Yes. Barbara? Yes, and I tried to get it into this year's budget and couldn't. And last question, in several other major cities across the nation, the mayor's office provides centralized information and resources in order to ensure immigrant and non-English speaking communities are connected to city programs, services, and policies. In San Diego, this critical information is usually limited to English, as we said, and therefore cannot be accessed by a significant percentage of our population and the office of the mayor recently hired an immigrant affairs manager for the first time. Do you support the expansion of immigrant affairs services in the mayor's office in order to expand outreach and civic engagement of immigrants and refugees in non-English speaking communities? I do. Barbara? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm now moving to the tenants rights section. Barbara, if you could please respond to these questions first. In January of this year, the state enacted AB 1482, which limits annual rent increases to 5% plus the inflation rate. As mayor, will you support a local rent control measure that goes further than AB 1482? No, I don't believe rent control works. Todd? I would support extending 1482 after its sunset if the state does not. but um, you would not support a rent control measure that limits annual rent increases beyond what AB 1482 does. No. I just wanna, okay, no. thank you. Um, would you support a tenant protection ordinance that would create a rent registry to collect eviction data, strengthen protections for tenants against bad landlords, and create a tenant board so community members have a place to go to access protections and information on their rights? Yes, I believe the state's going to mandate that. And not oh, sorry, decide. Todd, that was Barbara. Okay. Oh. Well, um, if the state mandates something, the state mandates it. But given our current budget issues, I don't want to commit to creating anything new within the city at this time. So that's a no to the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Todd. Yes, I believe that that's going to, again, be state law in the not distant future. So it was a no to the question. Well, and hopefully it's a funded mandate that the, the state provides the funding. So. Well, I would, <laughs> I'll be nice, thanks. Sorry, Todd, I wasn't clear on your response to the tenant protection ordinance question. I would support a rental registry. I think that data is important for understanding how we can help tenants. Okay, so that component of it is a yes. 
others. No, thank you. I just want to clarify for our community members. So last question. A uh, community land trust is when public land is developed and managed by a nonprofit corporation. There is no private profit and the community is an active participant in decisions on how the land is used, as well as what type of housing is developed on the trust land. Community land trusts have become critical tools for preserving long term housing affordability and increasing community ownership in many other cities. As we face an increasingly urgent housing crisis here in San Diego, would you support using city owned land to create community land trust housing for public benefit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Todd. Yes, it's a part of my recovery plan. All right, this is the final section of our rapid fire questions related to environmental justice. And Todd, you'll be responding to it first. Youth opportunity passes are no cost transit passes for youth who are 24, 24 years old or younger. Um, and several other cities have invested in youth opportunity passes as a way to provide more students with access to jobs and educational opportunities. And because more young people are riding transit, that means more people are using transit long term, which also means fewer cars, less traffic, reduced emissions, and a cleaner environment. And the mayor of LA recently announced a commitment to no cost transit for youth. Will you follow the lead of LA's mayor? and commit to funding youth opportunity passes in San Diego? Yes. Barbara? Yes. MTS Fund, which runs our local transit system, has been criticized for its fair enforcement practices. Transit riders are at risk of having their lives derailed just because they can't afford a bus or trolley ticket. If a citation is not addressed within 120 days, individuals are sent to criminal courts where substantial fees may be added to their fines and a second unpaid ticket can even become a misdemeanor, which affects credit scores and has other long lasting consequences. As a member of the MTS board, will you support moving the enforcement of fair evasion from criminal courts to civil courts? Todd? Absolutely, yes. Barbara? Yes, I'm appalled by what MTS is doing. And last question, San Diego recently created a climate equity index. And this index uses data to help the city determine which neighborhoods are most impacted by pollution and therefore should be prioritized for climate related investments. However, while developing this new index, the city left out some critical data. The information the city left out is used by the state in its version of the index. And because of this oversight, some heavily impacted communities have been left out of the city's index and may not receive the funding they need. As mayor, will you ensure that climate that the climate equity index takes into account air quality and all of the indicators used in the state's Cal Enviro screen? Todd? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Okay, well that concludes the question answer portion of this program. I wanna thank both of our candidates for joining us this evening and answering all of our questions. Before you both leave, we wanna give each of you two minutes to make a closing statement. Within that closing statement, we ask that you address the following question. Do you commit to meeting with the CBA within one month of getting into office? And Barbara, we're gonna start with you. Okay. Um I've met with the CBA regularly in person and on Zoom, and I will meet with you within one month of taking office to continue our relationship because I value your partnership in how the city should be making budget decisions. Uh, my life has been coming about coming up with solutions, not making empty promises. And that's what my roadmap to recovery is about. You can read about it on my website. We released it in June. I worked with a diverse group of community leaders, uh, high tech and biotech entrepreneurs, small business owners. I understood the urgency of getting something out quickly that will continue to get modified. It will continue to be a work in progress. So I look forward to getting your feedback on how we can make it better. For example, universal internet access is a key part of my roadmap to recovery. And one of the key parts of my roadmap to recovery is creating more job centers south of Interstate 8, particularly downtown and in Otay Mesa. 
and I have ideas about biotech, high tech, a biopharmaceutical manufacturing center in the South Bay. You don't need a college degree for these jobs. Miracosta College has a terrific biotech manufacturing certificate program. This city has so many opportunities in front of it. I am very, very excited. My campaign is a grassroots driven volunteer campaign. Most people did not expect that I would be in the final two. And I've had a very diverse life as a journalist, an entrepreneur, starting two organizations that empower women, as a mom, a grandma, a wife. And as I look forward to being your mayor, I'm thinking every day about your children and your grandchildren and what the impact of my decisions is going to be on them. The city needs a lot of fixing right now, but I believe that by working together, we can fix it. And I would be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Todd, please go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity this evening, for giving us some of your valuable time to share our visions for our city. Uh, to answer your question, of course, I would meet with CPI. I have been doing it with the Community Budget Alliance. I have done it for years. I will continue to do it. And I'll tell you, I will need to do it because I believe that the current budget is not properly balanced, that the next mayor is going to immediately have to deal with a more than $100 million budget deficit. And we must make those cuts to balance that budget in a way that takes care of communities that are most impacted with an equity lens, understanding that reductions in certain neighborhoods impact other neighborhoods much more significantly. Listen, my experience is in life uh, as a son of working class parents growing up in this community. I have lived what San Diego has promised, but I know that that promise is not being fulfilled for too many San Diegans. And my public service is all about doing what I can to make this city better. You will see me lead on the issue of affordable housing as I've done throughout my career. You'll see me lead on working to build a world-class transportation system, recognizing that for many, being able to walk, bicycle safely, or take quality public transit are the only options that are available to you. And our continued adherence to an outdated planet Sandag is not going to get us where we need to be as a community. Uh, and importantly, we must do something about our homelessness crisis. Uh, currently, the city is not leading in this regard. Uh, other cities across the nation are being uh, certified as ending chronic homelessness. San Diego should do the same thing. We can with the right leadership. You have seen me lead time and again, uh, not empty promises, but actually delivering on big and bold changes like a minimum wage increase in San Diego, paid sick days, a climate action plan, standing up to polluters and working against gun violence in our communities. I can do the same thing again as your mayor, uh, and I respectfully and humbly ask for your support. Let's make history this November in San Diego. Let's take our city in a new direction, an inclusive direction, creating a city that works for all of us. Thank you all very much for your time. Okay, well, thank you both again for joining us this evening. Good luck to you both, and we look forward to working with one of you to make San Diego a city that is more inclusive and equitable for our communities. Have a good night, y'all. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. So thank you, everyone, for joining us and our candidates. And each of the candidates' responses to our questions will be posted on the CPI website. And please visit cpisandiego.org slash CBA to take a look. We are in a critical moment in history with a high stakes election locally, nationally, you name it. And you heard from the candidates tonight. This forum is a step in learning more about where the candidates for the next mayor of San Diego stand. And we encourage you to do your due diligence and make sure you come out in force to vote in this election. The voting period is from October 5th, early voting, to November, to November 3rd and all voters will receive their ballot in the mail. So start planning now before we even get to November 3rd. Go to sdvote.com for more information because we know that when we all exercise our right to shape democracy, we maximize our impact collectively. Our work here today is not done. As a coalition, we will continue to demand more, expect more, and fight hard on the issues that matter the most to our communities, no matter who is elected into office. We know that. We will hold the next mayor of San Diego accountable to our community needs, our priorities, and the people's budget. 
So stay engaged and fight hard with us, along with us, alongside us, uh, alongside us every step of the way. Because it's going to take all of us being loud, being proud, being unapologetic about what we need and deserve so that we can all thrive. So we encourage you to follow us and our partner organizations through the budget cycle and holding our city and mayor accountable. In the spirit of Congresswoman Maxine Waters, let us reclaim our time. Thank you, Esmahan. Um, I wanna further uplift that this is a moment to plug into community and to build power with our families and neighbors because we all have a responsibility to each other and to challenge the systems that create inequalities. Um, as we grieve about how this crisis has exacerbated the ongoing crisis for historically impacted communities, we must organize even more fiercely. So yes, vote and also build power for what comes after with us and our partners. Part of building power is being bold with our priorities for what we wanna see in our communities. This is an opportunity to envision the world that is possible. All of you who joined us this evening, we want to hear from you. We want to know what your priorities for the city are and what is the city that you are envisioning for your family and neighbors. So if you registered for this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email by the end of the week with a short survey where you'll be able to share your priorities with us. We also included a link to the recorded or we also will include a link to the recorded webinar in that email. If you did not register and you would like to receive the survey and recording, please sign up at bit.ly slash CBA dash mayoral candidate forum, or you can email us at CBA at CPI San Diego.org. And that brings us almost to the end of our time together. Um, but before we close out, I did want to give some thank yous. Um, I want to thank our wonderful interpreters for translating, for translating tonight's event. Thank you all for your hard work and for making this event successful and accessible. I want to thank our Community Budget Alliance coalition partners and team. There was a lot of behind the scenes work that went into today's event. So thank you all for all the hard work you put in to create this event and make it happen and for the amazing work that you'll continue to do to uplift and serve our communities here in San Diego. I wanna thank my amazing co-moderator Ismahan. As always, it was a pleasure working with you and I had fun. Um, and last but definitely not least, I wanna thank every one of you that joined us for this mayoral forum tonight. We appreciate that you all took time out of your busy days during this heavy pandemic time to hear from the mayoral candidates and for your community your commitment to hold them accountable once elected. We hope that the questions we asked tonight really helped y'all to understand who these candidate, candidates are and what they stand for. I wanna end by sharing a quote with you all that a dear friend shared with me. The quote is by Miriam Kaba and it goes, we all have a role to play in this current moment. Find your lane and push ahead. Refuse to acquiesce to despair. There are many things, many ways that things can be different in the world, and we don't know how things will turn out, so we might as well fight. So that's it for tonight, y'all, uh, but let's keep pushing through and on. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evenings. Um, thank you again, and good night.